whenever you want to start it. Okay, thank you so much, Joy. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk in this lecture about antibiotic resistance. We're gonna focus more in gram negative bacteria. So recently we had a, a lecture or a case conference about pseudomonas. So we're gonna focus today in intervectoracia. So let's start with some key terms. So an antibiotic, as we know, is a drug that kills or inhibits the growth of microorganisms. And that is very important because as we know, we have two groups of uh, antibiotics, bacteriostatic and bactericidal. And if we have to define resistance, we have to say that it's an arbitrary designation that implies that an antimicrobial does not inhibit the bacterial growth at clinically achievable concentrations. And the second part of the definition is really important because it has to be clinically achievable, meaning that if we want to, let's say that an, a bacteria is resistant to an antibiotic, we can still uh, kill the bacteria with that antibiotic if we increase the concentration of the antibiotic. But for example, if we, with a gram of vancomycin, are not able to, uh, to kill MRSA in the blood, we might do that with a gallon of vancomycin, but uh, that wouldn't be uh, practical because we'll, you will end up killing the patient as well. So that's why it has to be a clinically achievable concentration. So keep that in concept in mind. And uh, there are two, two uh, concepts that we have to keep in mind in order to discuss about resistance. One of them is the MIC or minimum inhibitory concentration. And in order to explain this concept, we have here uh, the micro dilution technique that uses tubes. This technique was used in the, in the past years ago. We don't use it anymore because it's time consuming. And you, I mean, resource consuming as well. But it's important to explain the concept because in each tube we have colonies of bacteria growing. And it, when it grows, it becomes a turbid, all right? So for example, here we have bacteria growing freely and it becomes cloudy, all right? So in this tube, we don't have any antibiotic at all. But in the following tubes, Next to, ne next to this one or and, and, the, and the, in an ascending order, we have concentration of antibiotic. Let's say that here we have a little bit, that here we have more. And there is a point where you have enough antibiotic that the bacteria cannot grow anymore. And that's the MIC. Here in this example, so it's uh, translucent here, so the bacteria cannot grow, and that is the MIC. So that's an important concept that we have to to keep in mind in order to discuss resistance. And the other important concept is the breakpoint. And the breakpoint is an MIC that is already established by some uh, institutions in the case of, in the case of uh, USA will be CLSI. So the breakpoint will tell us if the bacteria is resistant or sensitive to the antibiotic, all right? So we have in Europe the UCAS that is gonna determine these uh, MICs or breakpoints. Uh, this is already established, so you don't have to calculate it, meaning that when the strain of the bacteria goes to the lab and you calculate or based on the dilution technique that you do, the bacteria has an MIC of, let's say, two to vancomycin. So you have a breakpoint already that is established by the CLSI. So if the bacteria has, let's say, less than four, will be sensitive to vancomycin. So if the bacteria has two, you can determine or you can conclude the bacteria is or the strain is sensitive to vancomycin. That's just an example, but we're going to discuss the MICs in a little bit uh, more detail in the next slide. We have many methods to determine susceptibility. We have manual methods, and in that group, we have the Kiri Bauer this diffusion. We use it here a lot in the United States, but I will say we, uh, we use it more in Europe. And we have the E-test, all right? Usually, we, we use this to uh, techniques in order to confirm the susceptibility of the antibiotics, all right? So here, the first step is to use a, an automated system. For example, we have micro dilution technique, and it, this is basically, you put the strain of the bacteria in the machine, and we have many of that. So we have the micro scan, we have the Vitec. Nowadays, we have the TREC that it uses the micro dilution technique and can give you exactly the MICs as a, and the susceptibility range of the bacteria, all right? So we have many mechanisms of resistance. And actually today we're gonna discuss about the beta lactamases, but we know that we have many points in the bacteria, uh, in the life cycle of the bacteria that you can inhibit or the bacteria can become resistant to the antibiotics. So in the protein synthesis, target modification, efflux pumps, uh, poor mutations, and there are specific types of bacteria, of bacteria that can develop multiple mechanisms of resistance at the same time. And the classic example of that is pseudomonas. 
But today, as I said, we're gonna focus on beta lactamases. As we know, these uh, enzymes are encoded by genes known as BLA, BLA. And these, uh, these enzymes will inactivate the metalactam antibiotics by splitting uh, the beta lactam ring, ring. All right. So we have now a lot of uh, beta lactamases, but the first one was described in 1940 that was actually isolated in the Bacillus coli. At that time, it was called like that, but nowadays we call it, uh, we call it E. coli. And it was an AMPC chromosomal uh, induced or co chromosomal codificated at that time, but now, or encoded. But now, uh, now we have other, other beta lactamases that are more frequent than this one that was uh, actually isolated first. Nowadays, we have more than 1900 beta lactamases identified. So we're, we're gonna talk about the main ones in this lecture. And we have many ways to classify beta lactamases. So, but there are two uh, ways to do it in a more, I will say like easily, all right, to, to, be, to be more understandable. One of them is based on the structure of the beta lactamases. For example, here we have the Ambler classification, that's the structural classification of beta lactamases. And we uh, use letters in order to, uh, to name the beta lactamases. We have A, B, C, and D, but we have subgroups here. For example, class, class A, C, and D are called serine beta lactamases. And the reason behind that is because they have the active serine site in the enzyme. The other group will be the class B uh, beta lactamases. And in this group, we have the metallo beta lactamases. And it's called like that because they use a zinc in the active site. So there, are, there is another classification that is called the functional classification. It is more subjective, subjective, but it's more clinically relevant. So by using this classification, we have three groups of beta lactamases, group one, two, and three. Group one is the cephalosporinases or AMC beta lactamases. Group two, uh, we have the serine uh, beta lactamases here. And in this group, we have the ESBL and carbapenemases. And we're gonna talk about these two uh, mechanisms in a little bit. In group three, we have the metallobetalactamases. That uh, actually metallobetalactamases, some of them are carbapenemases. So I'm gonna clarify this in a minute. One of them, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened here. All right, so, in recent years, the ones that is given us more problems is the group two uh, beta lactamases, meaning class A and D. And these are the ones that are more frequent nowadays or the frequency has increased in recent years. So let's start by ESBL. So we know that these are beta lactamases capable of, of hydrolyzing the third generation cephalosporin and being inhibited by, by the beta lactamase inhibitor clavulanic acid. And it's found in plasmids with resistance to multiple antibiotic classes. All right, E. coli and Klebsiella are the classic ones that can harbor this mechanism of resistance, but nowadays the rest of the enterobacteriaceous can develop ESVL as well. And the fact that it's in plasmids, codifying plasmids is important because that can be transferred from bacteria to another bacteria, all right? Easily transmissible. So in the US, if we analyze uh, of all the enterobacteriaceous that we have, the ones that have resistance by this mechanism is about 12% of them. So it's very important here. So, and we can say that ESVL in terms of antibiotics that will uh, confer resistance. So it will be resistant to penicillin, oxyimidocephalosporins, meaning third generation cephalosporin, such as ceftriaxin, and monobactams, all right? But it wouldn't be resistant to cefomycin, and this is a second generation cephalosporin, cefoxidin and cefotitan, but this is an in vitro effect, all right? It doesn't mean that you can use second generation cephalosporins in order to treat a bacteria that is resistant by this mechanism, ESVL, you cannot. But in vitro, you will find it sensitive to it. It is not resistant to carbapenems, and it's inhibited by beta lactamase inhibitors. One of the example of this will be Sosin, that's piperacillin tazobactin, all right? But we know we know nowadays that this antibiotic wouldn't be ideal to treat these bacteria, even if it is sensitive in the antibiogram. So this is an in vitro effect, but there are other things that are important, such as the inoculant effect. But this is just to clarify the concept. 
So in order to detect ESBL, we have many methods that gold the standard, I would say, is the PCR. And we have in the hospital at Jackson Memorial, the biofire uh, technique, all right? By this uh, biofire, we can detect the main genes that are responsible for producing ESBL. And the most common here in the United States will be the CTXM, but it's not the only one. And we're gonna review this in a little bit. The other test that we use will be the E-test. This is a manual test. As I said, it's on, in order to confirm what you have found in the, in other, uh, in the, for example, in the Vitec 2, if you want to confirm it, you have to use the E-test. There is another test that we don't use it. We don't use it here uh, in the hospital, but it's uh, very important in order to identify this ESVL mechanism. That is the double disc synergy. All right. And in some uh, hospital centers or some institutions that you don't have any of these tests to identify this mechanism of resistance, what you can use is markers of resistance. And actually, one of the surrogates will be the susceptibility sub to subtraction. If the MIC is uh, more than two micrograms per ml, that is a proxy for ESBL production, all right? Very important here. And these metals have different sensitivities and specificities. Probably the high, uh, the ones that with the higher sensitivity will be the Phoenix, but it has lower specificity as well, all right? So just keep that in mind. And as I said, the most common gene that produces ESBL in the United States will be CTXM, but we have other genes such as TM, SHB, and OXA. And that's why the antibiogram sometimes is, looks different in a bacteria that is producing ESBL, for example. Uh, a bacteria such as E. coli, if you look at the, at the, uh, at the antibiogram, could be, for example, resistant to, the, to cefepin, all right? And it can still qualify and it will qualify as ESBL because as we know, ESBL usually uh, give us resistance to all the cephalosporins, all right? But you can have, for example, an enterobacter that is sensitive to cefepin and it's still an ESBL, all right? Why is that? Because the mechanism of resistance is produced by a different gene, all right? For example, if it is produced by TEM, most likely when you do the antibiogram will be sensitive to cefepin, but it still will be an ESBL mechanism, all right? So keep in mind, it's not the same for all the bacteria and all the genes are different in terms of expressing the mechanism of resistance or expressing the, the resistance to certain antibiotics. So in order to, to discuss the treatment of, of ESBL, we're gonna base the, the recommendations on the, on the IDSA guideline. So we have one that was published, uh, published uh, last year and was updated this year, very useful recommendations. And if we, if, want to, if we want to discuss the treatment of ESVL first, the first line treatment will be carbapenems. As we know, we have many carbapenems, meropenem, imipenem probably are the most commonly used. And we have uh, probably more clinical evidence uh, for using these two carbapenems. But we have doripenem as well. We have in vitro data of doripenem being as good as meropenem or imipenem. And we have, uh, lastly, ertapenem. As we know, this is, will be in terms of spectrum. It's a narrow spectrum if we compare it with meropenem imipenem because it doesn't have uh, actually activity against pseudomona. So in terms of narrowing in the spectrum, ertapenem will be the drug to go. But in terms of uh, using this drug empirically or in the setting of ESBL, when you have uh, a patient that is in severe sepsis, some experts do not recommend to use ertapenem upfront because there are some studies, observational studies that have actually associated ertapenem with a higher risk of mortality, all right? It's not statistically significant, but at least numerically has been uh, higher than when you compare it with other carbapenems. That's why upfront, some experts do not use ertapenem. When the patient is stable, then you can switch it to ertapenem. That is no problem. Now, in terms of cephalosporins, studies have shown high failures with uh, cefepin, ceftraxon, so we don't use it for in this case. And in terms of piperacillin tazobactam or sosin, so we have some studies uh, because, I mean, I would say like not that long ago, 
piperacillin tazobatin was one of the drugs that we could use for ESVL, but now the concept has changed. And we have this study, a non-inferiority randomized clinical trial that included hospitalized patients enrolled from uh, 26 sites in nine countries from 2014 to 2017, that included adult patients with at least one positive blood culture with E. coli clepsiella. Testing non-susceptible to ceftraxone, but susceptible to piperacillin tisobactam. So basically it was ESVL. So according to this, uh, to this study, we have patients that receive piperacillin tisobactam, and we compare it with patients that receive meropenem for a duration of four, four to 14 days. And the primary outcome was all cause mortality 30 days after, after abdomenization. The non inferiority margin was 5%. As, as, as we can see here, it, it was higher than 5%, meaning that the mortality was higher in patients that, that were treated with piperacillin tazobactin in compared to the ones treated with meropenem. So that's why this is one of the studies that do not support the use of piperacillin tazobactin in patients with um, ESVL producing organisms. And if we review the recommendations from the IDSA guidelines, they say that piperacillin tazobactam should be avoided for the treatment of infections caused by ESBL, even if susceptibility to piperacillin tazobactam is demonstrated. Meaning that if in vitro it's still sensitive, it's better not to use it if we confirm that the, that the mechanism of resistance is production of ESBL. But there is a uh, there is an exception here. So let's say that you started your patient empirically without knowing that it's a bacteria that produces ESBL. You started your patient on piperacillin tazobactam, sourcing, and then the patient improves. Then the macro lab tells you that it's an ESBL organism, but the patient is already improving. So you don't need to switch. It's better just to continue the treatment and do not change or extend the antibiotic course. Just stay with piperacillin tazobactam. So meaning that probably clinical outcomes would be way better to, to assess if the patient is responding well to, well to the antibiotics. So do not stick to the macro data. If the patient is improving already, it's, it's reasonable to continue with the same drug. I hope this is clear. And we uh, use this concept usually in patients that have urinary tract infections because we know that people are silly taste back and will achieve very high concentrations in the urine most likely will overcome this mechanism of ESVR. So now in terms of cefepim. So uh, as I said, cefepim is not an ideal drug to use uh, for ESVL, and we have many uh, studies that demonstrate that. And this is an observational study. This is a propensity score match study of patients with ESVL bacteremia. They assess the mortality, 14-day mortality of patients with ESVL bacteremia uh, that receive cefepim versus uh, empiric uh, carbapenem therapy. And there was a trend towards increased mortality in the cefepin group. So that's why uh, the IDSA guidelines state that we shouldn't uh, use cefepin for the treatment of infections caused by ESVL, even if susceptibility to, ce to cefepin is demonstrated. So as we mentioned before, I mean, uh, if you look at, at the antibiogram of uh, bacteria that is producing ESBL, the antibiogram can tell you that it's sensitive to cefepin because it might be a TEM gene that is producing it, all right? And if, but if that is the case, but you know that the bacteria is ESBL producer, even if it is sensitive in the antibiogram, it's better not to use it, especially if you are dealing with severe infections or complicated infections. But the same concept that we discussed with uh, piperacillin tazobactam, if, you start this empirically and the patient is already improving on that, even if the micro lab tells you that it is resistant to cefepim or it's an ESBL producing organism, it's better to continue because the patient is already improving. Now, uh, in terms of quinolones, uh, we know that the mechanism of resistance of ESBL is a beta lactamase, and quinolones is not a beta lactam. So in theory, it should be sensitive, the bacteria should be sensitive to quinolones. But most of the times, or the majority of the times, I would say that these mechanisms of ESBL is producing plasmids. And plasmid has a lot of information, including genes that will give you resistance to other antibiotics, including quinolones in this case. All right, so that's why you have to be very careful and you have to confirm that the bacteria is sensitive to quinolones in order to use it in a 
in a, in a strain that is producing ESBL. So if that is the case and that MIC is less than 0.5 or one, then I think you can use it safely, especially if you're dealing with UTIs. Now in terms of Bactrim, the same uh, phenomenon applies in meaning that the plasmid can have information that, or genes that could codify for, or encode for resistance for uh, Bactrim. But if it is sensitive, if you confirm that it's sensitive, so you can use it, especially in the setting of UTIs, uh, um, I would say cystitis most of the times. So now if we talk about cystitis, because that's very important, we have, according to the, to the IDSA guidelines, many alternatives. Nitrofurantoin and Bactrim are the preferred treatment, but we have alternatives. Augmenting is one of them. It sounds contradictory because we said that augmenting shouldn't be uh, one of the drugs that is used in this setting of ESVL production. But we, say, we said at the same time that this drug can increase or can concentrate uh, a lot or it can achieve high concentrations in the year. So you might be able to overcome the mechanism of resistance and in an uncomplicated infection such as cystitis could be useful. Other alternatives, we have single dose aminoglycosides, oral phosphomycin, uh, typically we use in the setting of E. coli. It's better not to use it in Klebsiella or Proteus because they have the false A gene that will give resistant to resistance to phosphomycin, all right? And lastly, we have fluoroquinolones. We mentioned this already. Okay, now let's uh, talk about this case, a real uh, life case, all right? So this is an 85 year old woman that presented to the hospital after sustaining burn injuries and a smoke exposure from a house fire. On physical exam, she has second degree burns on her first three fingers on the right hand and on the index finger and thumb of, the, of her left hand. She had first degree burns on the rest of her hands and both her arms as well as the entire face of the Okay, so I will ask uh, Ukoha to mute uh, her microphone, please. Thank you. Shortly after admission, the patient experienced difficulty breathing, trouble swallowing, voice changes, and swelling around her mouth and tongue. She was intubated and transferred to the ICU. Due to the development of fevers, blood and urine cultures were taken. She was started on cefepine and vancomycin for aspiration pneumonia. Blood culture through MSSA and urine culture was positive for Morganella morgani. Four day, days later, she developed spontaneous pneumothorax that required chest displacement. Okay, so persistence of fevers and worsening leukocytosis prompted antibiotic escalation to meropenin with continuation of vancomycin, and she completed 12 days of antibiotics. So an extensive use of antibiotics here. Three days later, the patient developed a new episode of fever. And we have an x-ray that is showing uh, worsening infiltrates in both lungs. And we have the gram stain from endotracal aspirate that is showing uh, gram negative bacteria. And we have here the McConkey agar that is turning pink, meaning that it's a lactose-producing organism, lactose-fermenting organism. So the patient was studied empirically on cefepine, and the central lines were removed because they were one of the potential sources of infection. And the culture finally grew, Rautella planticola, that is uh, actually a type of Klebsiella. And if we take a look at the antibiogram here, resistant to many antibiotics, including, including carbapenem. All right, so we order the Virgin uh, test, the Virgin system, and we identify two genes, the KPC, so that, that's the class A carbapenemases, uh, one of the genes that produce class A carbapenemases, and the CTXM gene, that is one of the, the ones that produce uh, ESBL, beta-lactamases. So what to do in this situation? So this is gonna help us to discuss the next topic that is carbapenemases. So this was uh, started here, the outbreak, an important outbreak in 2000 in New York and North Carolina, but nowadays have uh, spread to the whole country. And we have three types of carbapenemases. 
So we have the class A that is called, as we know, serine carbapenemases, and usually is uh, encoded in plasmids, but we have some of them that are coming from the chromosomes. And the most important here will be the KPC, here meaning in the United States, KPC will be the most important, the most frequent. The other that we have that is very important because probably is the most difficult to treat will be metallobetalactamases or class B that is encoded uh, in plasmids. We have some chromosomes as well, but here uh, I will say the most important will be encoded in plasmids. And the third one, we have the oxabetalactamases or class D. And in this situation, uh, we have some of them that produces in the chromosomes and others in plasmids. Um, I, I don't think it's very frequent here, but in Turkey, this is really uh, endemic. Now, in order to detect carbapenemases, first we have to suspect about this, and the way to uh, and the way to do it is when you have or when you're dealing with interbacteriation and you find resistance to extended spectrum cephalosporins, meaning uh, third and fourth generation cephalosporins. And when you have an MIC to carbapenem above two micrograms per ml. So ertapenem will be the most sensitive uh, antibiotic. So we'll, this will be the screening carbapenem in order to detect or to suspect carbapenem maize producing, uh, producing organisms. But in order to confirm, we have two tests, phenotypic and genotypic. And in order to discuss the phenotypic test, we have the modified Hodge test. And this is the old one that was used until 2018, probably. And it's, it was useful, but it had some problems of, um, of false positive and false negatives, especially with uh, metallobetalactamases, a lot of false negatives with this. So that's why we don't use it anymore. Nowadays, we have the modified carbapenem inactivation method that has a very good sensitivity and specificity from 93 to 100%. And it performs well with class A, B, and D carbapenemases. And it's recommended by the CLSI. We have other, uh, other phenotypic tests, the, the blue carba or carba MP, that basically takes advantage of the production of the of, uh, CO2 when the carbapenem is hydrolyzed. And they use this in the agar, and you mark it with color, and that in turn is blue or red, depending on the, on the, of the one that you are using it. OK, very good. And we have this in Jackson as well. So I think we have the rapid carba MP, I believe. So that's a chrome agar. And we have the genotypic test. So this is, I would say, the gold standard. So we have many of that uh, of them. So if we have to mention the most important, we have the film array. This is the biofire. And the biofire detects KPC, very important because it's the most frequent here. But we have others such as the viragene or nanosphere and the expert carba R. We have this in at Jackson. And these two tests will detect KPC, but will detect other genes, such as uh, the ones that produces metallobetalactamases, for example, New Delhi metallobetalactamases, NTM gene, VIM, and AMP. And on top of that, they will detect the OXA48. So very important. Nowadays at Jackson, we have the extended biofire that it has 43 targets and will detect all the genes that I just mentioned, meaning the IMP, KPC, OXA type, New Delhi and BIM, but on top of that, in the setting of uh, gram negative and beta lactamases, we'll detect the CTXM that it will produce um, ESBLs. All right. Now, I just mentioned all the genes that, pr that produce beta lactamases, but there are certain strains that, on top of producing beta lactamases, will produce other mechanisms or develop other mechanisms of resistance. For example, poebutation, efflux pump. And in order to detect those, we'll have to sequence the whole genome. All right. For in order to do that, we have the next generation sequence sequencing. We don't have it here in-house at Jackson, but we we actually send it out to other uh, in, uh, research centers and they are able to, to, um, to sequence the whole 
the whole genome. And we can detect uh, simultaneous uh, mechanism of resistance, especially in the strains that are producing metallobetalactamases or pseudomona, because we know that these type of strains will have many mechanisms of resistance at the same time. Now let's talk about the treatment of, treatment of these infections. And uh, again, we're gonna base uh, the discussion on the IBSA guideline. And according to that, for KPC, producing infections outside the urinary tract, we have three drugs that are first line. Septacetam avibactam, that is the Avicet, meropenem avibactam, babomir, and imipenem silastatin relibactam, recaprio, all right? Three drugs here, first line, according to the IDSA. Now for OXA48, so the only of the only one of these drugs that are, have activity against the OXA48 will be Avicens, all right? Keep that in mind. So in, well, we, we know that we have septazolone tesobactam that is surbaxone that we use a lot, especially in pseudomonas that is resistant to carbapenems. But keep in mind, this antibiotic doesn't have any activity against carbapenemases. It was developed for multidrug resistant pseudomona, especially when they have efflux pump on poor mutation. But if it has carbapenemases, or we're dealing with enterobacteria that is producing carbapenemases, Cervaxa is not active at all. Now, in order uh, to compare these drugs, because we said oh, these three are very, uh, are first line for carbapenemase uh, producing organisms. And we have some, some data that will tell us that meropenic vaporbactam is as good as Avicus. I'm not gonna go into detail, uh, I can just tell you that the clinical success in this study, when we compare Avicas uh, versus uh, Dabomir, was, was actually the same. So very useful both. But there is an important point here. Over the years, so strains have developed resistance to Avicas. And according to some data that we have, especially from Europe, the resistance to Avicas will be in the in the rate of 10%. So that's why if you have a patient that you treated, a patient that has an infection caused by a gram negative that is producing carbapenemases, and you treat the patient with Avicus, the patient gets cured, but the patient, let's say, develop a recurrence or a, a second episode, a third episode. So probably Avicus wouldn't be the best choice because the resistance can develop more easily. So, I would recommend in this situation of recurrence to use uh, Babomir because uh, this rate of resistance is lower than Avicus. I hope that is clear. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. And one of the one of the things that we uh, that we do when there is a high MIC to septacidem avivactin to Avicus, according to some experts, we should add a second agent, typically carbapenem to decrease this MIC. In terms of imipenem relibactam, we don't have too many uh, clinical studies, but we have in vitro data that tell us that it's as good as the antibiotics that I just mentioned. Now, in terms of uh, metallobetalactamases, according to the IDSA, the first line drugs here will be cephedurical, and a combination of cetacement avibactam plus astronom. So let's keep in mind that astronom will be the most active antibiotic against metallobetalactamases, but we don't use it by itself because usually these strains, these bacteria will produce ESBL on top of the carbapenemases, all right? And that's why if we give astronom, astronom by itself, it will be hydrolyzed by the ESBL, all right? So that's why we have to use it along with septacin and avibactam because it has the, the beta-lactamase inhibitor of, uh, I would say a broad spectrum beta-lactamase inhibitor such as avibactam will, that will knock out including ESBLs, all right? Well, I would say that probably an antibiotic that should be developed will be avibactam astronam, but we don't have that. So we have to, to, to give abicas because of the avibactam component plus astronam. All right, I hope the concept is clear. If not, you can ask me later. 
Okay, so and we have the studies to support the use of Abigas plus Astronam, and this is a prospective observational study from Greece and Italy uh, that compare ceftacidem avibactam plus Astronam versus other active antibiotics in patients with bloodstream infections. And here we can note that uh, we can notice that the, it has these patients had treated with Abicas plus Astronam had a lower 30 day mortality, lower clinical failure at day 14, and shorter uh, length of stay. All right, so demonstrates that this is one of the drugs that we should use in this setting. And the other medication that we can use in metallobetalactam is producing organism will be cephidiracol. This is a novel C04 cephalosporin. We'll take advantage of the iron transport system in order to go inside the cell or inside and going into the periplasmic space. And then it can actually bind to the, into the penicillin binding protein, all right? It doesn't have activity again, against gram-positive bacteria or anaerobic uh, bacteria, okay? But it has very good activity against carbapenem resistant enterobacteration. And pseudomonas too. We're gonna discuss this in a minute. We have a very important study that is called the Credible CR study that is a randomized open label multicenter viral group pathogen focus descriptive phase three study that was uh, that took place in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And this uh, was to evaluate patients with nosocomial pneumonia, bloodstream infections, or sepsis, or complicated urinary tract infections, and evidence of a carbapenem resistant gram negative pathogen. If we uh, actually analyze the pathogens that were identified, most of them, 46%, were Acinetobacter baumannii, but 33% uh, of them will be Klebsiella. And lastly, we have Pseudomonas aeruginosa, meaning that probably the conclusions from this study will apply more to patients with uh, Acinetobacter baumannii, but we have some interesting data that we can discuss about interbacteria as well. Okay, the idea of this study was to compare cephidiracol versus the best available therapy. And if we analyze the results in the patients that develop nosocomial, nosocomial pneumonia, the clinical cure was 50% uh, in the cephidiracol group, oh, I'm sorry, versus 53% in the group of best available therapy. So it wasn't significant, the difference was not significant. The same for bloodstream infection. If we compare the groups, 43% of clinical cure for both of them, all right? And for complicated UTI, the macrobiologic eradication was higher in the patients with, uh, that received cephidiracol versus 20% of the patients that received best available therapy, meaning that there was uh, macrobiologic success that was good, uh, that was actually uh, eradication was higher, but in terms of clinical care, probably it wasn't, it, it was the same as the ones that received best available therapy. We don't know exactly how to interpret these, uh, these results because apparently there is, no, uh, there is no clinical implication of eradication of, of the bacteria faster. But I mean, uh, this is the best data that we have. But one of the most interesting findings here will be uh, about the mortality because 34% of the patients that receive cephidiracol die versus 18% of the patients that receive best available therapy. So it was actually associated with higher mortality in the cephidiracol group. And again, we don't know exactly how to interpret this result because we know that the eradication of the bacteria occur faster or in a higher frequency in the patients that receive this new drug. But that these findings probably will apply more for Acinetobacter baumannii. And that's why in, in patients that, that have a multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter baumannii, we don't use cephidiracol by itself because the, the evidence, well, it is kind of confusing, all right? So we, we prefer to use cephidiracol plus another agent the best available that we have. And that's the rational based on this study. But if we analyze the data on carbapenem resistant interbacterations from this study from the credible uh, CR, we find that a clinical cure was 66% in the cephidiracol group versus 45% in the best available therapy group. And in terms of beta metallobetalactamases, the 
clinical care was 75% in the cephalogram group and 29% in the group of best available therapy. And there was no mortality benefit uh, between these two groups, all right? So there is some clinical benefit according to this, uh, to this result, but I mean, the, uh, the number of patients is small to, uh, to give definitive uh, conclusions about that. But the data so far is looking good. I think we need uh, more studies that include more, like a, a, high, uh, a higher number of patients. All right, so now in terms of alternative agents for carbapenemis producing organisms, we have colistin polymyxin. And if we review the recommendations from IDSA, these drugs are, should be avoided uh, for treatment of these infections, all right, because of the side effects that will cause. Um, but if you had to use it, probably the, the only indication would be cystitis. And actually not only because of the side effects, is because uh, if, when you compare it with the beta-lactam beta with beta lactamase inhibitor, for example, Avicas or, or Babomir, the mortality will be higher in the patients treated with colistin if you compare it with those drugs. I'm sorry. So uh, to mention other drugs that we can use, uh, tagacycline, high doses, that's one of the drugs that we can use for intra-abdominal infections. Aravacycline is another one that is actually from the same class, but just the newer antibiotic. And we can use it as monotherapy, and it's approved for intra-abdominal infections. But we have to avoid these drugs in other infections, especially bloodstream infections, because we know that the concentration that, that is achieved in the, in the blood is very low. Other options, so combinations, for example, let's say in a, in a, in a country that we don't have uh, Abicas or Babumir or Recabrio, we can use combination treatment and the drug of the first line will be colistin polymyxin. But I mean, not here in the US, probably in other countries. And we can associate this, this antibiotic with meropenem if the MIC2 meropenem is less than eight, so you can associate colistin plus meropenem. You can do, for example, colistin plus digacycline, or in the case that the strain is resistant to everything, including colistin, digacycline, or abacycline. So some experts have used ertapenem, ertapenem plus meropenem. And we said that ertapenem is the one that, that we use for screening. And the reason is that has a higher affinity for the carbapenemases. So what we do here is to distract the carbapenemases. So if we provide ertapenem, so the carbapenemases will actually try to, uh, to kill or to hydrolyze the ertapenem. And by doing that, it will be distracted. Then the meropenem will go inside the bacteria and will kill it. That's the whole uh, rationale to use this double carbapenem therapy. Now, uh, if we review some clinical scenarios, for example, for complicated UTI, we have some options, plasomycin, a new aminoglycoside can be used uh, in this setting, and parenteral phosphomycin, we don't have it here in the United States, but it would have been a, a good choice in, in the setting, well, in the case that we don't have any other alternatives. In the case of uncomplicated cystitis, so here we're talking about beta-lactamases, so meaning that we can potentially use other class of antibiotics that are not beta lactams and the, and the, and the um, occasion that we use that is in the setting of cystitis. And here we can use ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, Bactrim, nitrofurantoin, single dose of uh, an aminoglycoside or, or aphosomycin, okay? But only in the case of cystitis. Now, going back to our case, so what we did here was to test, and this is the e-test, uh, we performed the susceptibility for the Abicats and the meropenem Bacterium, and it was sensitive to both of them. So we decided to start a patient on Abicats plus polymyxin B initially. Then it was de-escalated to only Abicats. The patient completed two weeks of treatment and, and got better. The blood cultures uh, became uh, negative. This case report uh, is published already, so if you would like some details, you can just go into PubMed and look for it. So in conclusion, production of beta lactamases is the main mechanism of resistance in gram-negative uh, organisms. Carbapenem is a drug of choice of ESBL organisms, 
carbapenemase production constitutes a concerning issue in gram negatives. The recommended treatment for carbapenem resistant intravectoraceous are avicas, babumir, imipenem relevactam, and cefeteracol. And combination therapy based on colistin is only recommended as an alternative uh, agent. Okay, and with that, uh, we finished the lecture. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, thank, thank you, you so much, Gonzalez. Uh, oh, was somebody else gonna answer a question? Yeah, I have a question. And I know that in the past, uh, we used to use a PIP TASO for non bacteremic ESBL. A UTIs. Can we use it now? Is safe or or we have to go for the carbapenem if the patient is not bacteremic? I mean, it depends. If you don't have carbapenem and uh, there is nothing else to use except for the taser, I would say, okay, you can attempt doing it if the patient is developing a UTI. Now, as I said, if you started the patient empirical, empirical without knowing that it's an ESBL producing organism and the patient is already improving on that, even if the, if the micro lab tells you that it's a resist or if, even if the micro lab tells you that it's ESBL, you can continue with uh, peptase and complete the treatment if the patient is already improving, it's fine. Okay, and then my other question is um, the combination, the Abicas plus astronum is for metallo. What do we do for OXA? What is the recommendation for OXA? For OXA, as I said, the only one is Abicas that has activity against the OXA foliate. We do Abicas as uh, no. If it's resistant, we go to cephaderic or something. Yeah, I mean, cephaderical has activity against OXA type as well. So two drugs, cephaderical or Abicas. If it is resistant, yeah, you can attempt cephaderical. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the bottom line here is that uh, you cannot use, for example, Babumir or Recaprio for OXA type. It's not active. Okay, any other question? Okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, very good. Where do we have, that was recorded and you will have it like in Facebook or were you gonna put it in, a, in the drive? I'm not sure where it's recorded. So I'll, I'll look for it, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, because it's, it's good to see it again. All right, sure, I'll look for it. All, All right. right, see you. Thank you guys, bye.